This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here. Go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. I am predicting up front. This one is going to be a banger, people. Kyle is out today, so I brought in my man, Josh Gurley, is a co-host. And we have what I know to be an electric guest, Mr. Micah Salas from Austin, Texas. And we are going to talk about commercial insurance shop for the next little bit. And I'm going to give you guys a break. I'm going to have Micah talk a little bit. I'm going to ask him a question and let him answer. And while he's doing that, get out your pens and your pads, people. You're going to need them for this one. So listen, I was in the um, funny story. I went to take my shower this morning and I get in the shower and I go to grab my bottle of shampoo and I can't see it. And I can't figure out like what's going on with my eyes. And then I reach up and realize that I'd left my glasses on when I got in the shower, <laughs> completely forgot to take them off. First time ever happened. Um, but anyhow, you have been with a well-known national direct writer. You have been with a well-known international, the largest brokerage in the entire world. I'll just go ahead and call it out. Yeah. And now you have you have been to those two places and you have migrated. I don't know anything at all about the place you're at. So why don't you talk a little bit about talk about your shop and and, and sort of what motivated you to leave an, an environment that I suspect has the ability to provide you with almost any and every resource you need to go to where you're at now. Great question. And uh, I still get asked that question a lot, right? Because you're, you're with the biggest, the best, you know, why would you, why would you leave? But um, so Christensen Group, basically who we are, we're, you know, we're a 100% employee owned agency out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I think it was established in, I want to say 1960. Um, and they decided, to, the original owners decided to go ESOP, sell it back to the employees. This was in 2005 when everyone else was selling out to the big boys. And basically our owners had thought, Hey, let's try this model. So it's worked out phenomenally well. You know, I think at that time we were maybe 25, 30 employees. Now we're just over 200 and we, we, I'd say 95% of our growth has been organic, just finding producers uh, across the country, really originally in Minneapolis, they kind of saturated that market, then expanded down to Kansas city, kind of, we got four people there now kind of, I'm leading the charge down here in Texas. I wasn't brought on for that purpose necessarily, but obviously helping with recruiting and, and bringing on good people. And we have three people, hopefully soon to be four here in Texas and essentially our first year. So, um, but yeah, we're an independent agency, uh, you know, privately owned, hundred uh, percent employee owned and probably very similar to a lot of people listening. You just, you know, you know, didn't want to necessarily sell out to the, the big corporations that are buying up everybody and wanted to do it a different way. So um, I'm actually happy to hear that because the ESOP model is where I'm headed. I think, I think I finally made up my mind. I had this really creative way that I was going to give everybody, the agency, a path to equity. And then I listened to Chris Burand on uh, insurance guys podcast and he scared the bejesus out of me. And I decided I'm not going to go down that road because I found out that what I was planning on doing would have created an immediate tax liability for anybody that I gave equity to that is due on on that day. And I'm like, okay, probably don't need to go this route. And, and you know, my biggest thing is, and why I like to hear about ESOP and I'll be interested, you, you know, tell me as much or as little as you're allowed to, but you know, my theory on that was I wanted to have, I want a vehicle that allows everybody in the operation to have an opportunity to own a piece of it. I want everybody to think like 
they're an owner, even though, you know, we're all given different skill sets, all, all different abilities. I just feel like the service service segment of our business gets slighted when the equity discussion comes. And, you know, if you look anywhere, unless it's like an ESOP or something like that, it's pretty, pretty rare that you see the title partner next to anybody who handles the service end of these operations, unless it's like a husband and wife agency, or, you know, it's somebody who has just been there forever and they gave, you know, they, they earned the title chief operations officer or something like that. Um, but you know, you, you don't see partnership that way. So the way that you guys are structured, is that accurate that everybody actually has the ability to be an owner? Um, and I mean, it's just, it's, and it's amazing what that does for people, man, what it does for their family, because, my wife's company is privately held. Um, it's also an ESOP. And there are people that are multimillionaires just because they've been there for 20 or 30 years. You know, I know what hers is worth and she's not even 20 years in yet. And my goodness, man, what a great benefit for the people that help you build your business. And I want Josh to hear this too, because Josh just recently took over the agency. Um, Josh and Andrew, uh, Waylon Smith, who was their partner, retired, living large with the Georgia win, I'm sure, as is Josh. But <laughs> you know, um, there's no yeah. doubt in my mind Waylon was going to California, Josh. I mean, I, I knew the play, the pictures were coming, but um, oh, there's you know, a know there's th a video out there of Waylon twirling a baton. He's gonna kill me for saying this, but there's a video <laughs> out there of him twirling the baton with the with the majorettes, the UGA majorettes. So of course he was. Uh, he had a <laughs> he had a great time, and he's been asking everybody to take the video down, but it's not going to happen. I'll interject this. I think this is an interesting stat because I recently went to a uh, a management liability class um, it, up in uh, Cincinnati, and one of the questions uh, came up, and it was about ESOPs, and I, and I think this is interesting. It, and they asked how many ESOPs exist in America. And I mean, I was looking around like, I, I have no idea. And I, I wrote down a number of like 50,000, you know, I said, there's probably 50,000 ESOPs in America, a thousand per state. And dude, I was dead wrong. There's only 11,000 ESOPs in the whole country. Um, Why? It's, it, you, know, you know, I don't know. That's probably a good question for Micah. I mean, they, they, I don't know if it's like, you know, ownership just kind of wants to have that control or you know, or, or what the deal is, but um, it's a lot less than you would think. I would but guess yeah. if I had to, and I'll, I, I want to hear what Mike has to say too. I would guess it probably has something to do with when you have an ESOP like that, everybody has to be included in it, right? Like you can't, you can't carve it out. You can't have an ESOP and then the producers are the only ones. I don't, I, at least I don't think that's the way that it works. I think it has to be, it's kind of like a, you know, similar to how a, a safe harbor 401k or a, a simple IRA requires that it's an equal contribution across the board or something. I have, I just have a feeling it has to do with the, uh, being equal for everybody. So I will preface what I say is I am not an ESOP expert. <laughs> I've no, learned a lot. I didn't, ex I didn't expect you to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've learned a lot in the last year. And obviously it was a big, it was a huge factor of me joining for, for reasons we can get into, but, but to answer your the question of does everyone have to participate? The answer is no, actually. Um, this I do know is that um, you can structure them where it's a partial ESOP and we, we're, we're actually pretty unique. So for example, let's just say there is 11,000 ESOPs. If you get down to a hundred percent employee owned, you're probably talking, you know, a quarter of that or half of that even. So we actually are, are indeed a hundred percent meeting our receptionist, our CSM, you know, account managers, marketing people, whatever. We all get a portion of our income every year that goes towards buying shares in that in that company. And then at age 60, we're, we're hopefully cut a big fat check, right? And um, so, but yeah, to answer your question, David, you can structure them a lot of different ways. And um, I would say this, if you actually ever are interested in kind of thinking about it, I'd be happy to connect you with Charlie uh, Christensen, who's- Well, that uh, was the next question, man. <laughs> that yeah, was the next yeah, question. He, Really sharp guy. Uh, he was he was instrumental in me coming over here. He's third generation. You know, uh, his dad was the one who actually sold um, to to all the employees. But it's a cool. It's man the experience. So they're like, hey, just wait till you come to the first annual ESOP meeting, right? And they do it every May, and they release the share price, and everyone goes nuts. And I kind of felt like you're watching like that 
you know, one of those, I don't, I don't want to use Wolf of Wall Street, but kind of that feeling where it's like that camaraderie. Yeah, no. you know, oh, yeah, yeah that's awesome. exactly what I was thinking about only because yeah. I just recently watched it again. Yeah, yeah. That's a great movie, by the way. I got to watch that again, too. Um, but man, so it was our share prices, obviously, you know, with the insurance agencies are going for multiples and stuff. And it just, you know, it skyrocketed from, you know, mid 60s up to upper 90s. And you got people there. Again, we don't lose people if they've been with us for five. We just kind of say that sweet spot is probably four to five years. If you hit that, you're just not leaving because you got people making, let's just say, fifty thousand a year that know they're going to have a million, you know, million and a half dollar check coming their way if they just ride it out on top of their four hundred one k. So this is not. This doesn't pull away from four hundred one k dollars, health benefits. We still pay competitive salaries, all that stuff. Um, so it's a neat deal. Um, it's it's special. For sure. The way yours is signed up and it's open to everybody, right? So if I'm a, see, that's one of the cool parts yep. about when I was in, when I was in the grocery industry and even when I worked with, with Target, they had a, it, what we, we didn't have ESOP, but we did have a pretty cool employee stock ownership. You know, it, you could buy employee stock. It, who knows, man, technically maybe it wasn't ESOP on the back end, but uh, we were publicly traded and we were able to buy the stock at a discount from whatever the share price was. And the company would finance it interest-free over like five years or something like that. So every time employee stock came around, like I gobbled it up, I got as much as I could. Um, yeah. But, to, but for yours was every, I mean, everybody, it doesn't matter like what your role is. I think I probably already asked that. So let's get in, let's get into the next thing. Sure. You have a new book out. That's I why do. I reached out is I saw that you had a new book out. Now, let me ask you this. Is this something, <laughs> yeah, the business insurance playbook, is this something that is designed for you to leave as a leave behind or to send to prospects and clients like Steven Sedlak does with the work comp, uh, work comp effect, or is it more for education for the industry or, did it become serendipitously both? <laughs> yeah. So it was written with the intention of being a marketing, an educational book for business owners. Uh, have no intent of if you look if you read it, look at the language. It's not geared towards a, someone selling insurance. Now I've gotten a ton of feedback from producers who bought it. Who's like, hey man, I love just like my LinkedIn content. Hey, love this content. It really helped me because I'm basically I've written the book as if I'm speaking directly to my uncle who owns his own construction company. And this is how, if I was you, man, this is how I'd buy my insurance. <clears throat> so that's the kind of voice I'm using or the narrative I'm using in the book. And then, yeah, it's uh, I thought, now, did you hey, do well, that as an example or did you do it like a storyteller of you talking to your uncle? I haven't read it I, yet. I ordered it, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't, I, that's actually a good idea. Should I talk to you before? I know it's but a I really good idea. <laughs> I was going to give you mad props for it, man, because that would be a yeah. really creative way. And I would think taking a somewhat boring topic and making it more engaging, right? So I'm not yeah. going to go out and write that book, Mike. It's all yours. <laughs> Take that and do it next time. I took notes, man. I'm going to I'm gonna remember that. Um, and you mentioned boring, right? So the whole reason this book is literally, you know, it's like, you should be able to read this thing in hopefully 30 to 40 minutes. And I didn't get into coverage details. I, I mean, you and I have both spoke with business owners, even CFOs, even at, even at sophisticated companies. They just don't want to read a book on insurance and I don't I, I and, and quite don't, honestly right? they don't care about what what the coverage says until there's a claim right like I I yeah. can't stand people going in there are questions you need to answer to a prospect about insurance what you don't need to do is go in and pontificate at a CPCU level to your buyer about everything you know about a policy they simply <laughs> don't care and you're going to talk yourself out of a deal Hundred percent agree. A hundred percent agree. And and I was actually thinking about this the other day. I was thinking back to first calls, like first meetings. About the, I think I made a post with this. How many times have I ever had a coverage or a coverage question come up or posed to me by some buyer? You know, the biggest fear in our minds is a new producer is like, I don't know enough to to get out there and talk to people. Dude, I have been maybe once. I think someone's actually asked me a coverage specific related question, and that's even. Yeah, I, I agree with that, man. I'd say I use the same example every time. It's not like you're going to go do a marketing drop on somebody, and the CFO is going to come across the lobby like Tom Cruise and risky business in his socks and say, <laughs> "Hey, man, can you tell me about that CG 2010?" Uh, like nobody's going to ask you that stuff. Just get out there and talk to people. 
Yeah, no, no, I, I 100% agree. And that the funny thing is, I probably fall in the boat of the people who didn't feel confident. Like, I want to feel confident, right? That's what I'll oh, I did too. I want to feel did. confident what I'm telling. Yeah. And I just think you just got to get over that barrier in your mind, is, especially a young producer when you don't know the form, you don't know the policy, you can't speak to it, but you can know enough. I think we all can know enough to be dangerous. You've talked about this in your social media content. Like, talk about services, talk about um, how you control the renewal negotiation process, talk about, you know, that's the kind of, tell them how the insurance game works. No one's even explained that and, you know, how it's distributed. I mean, those, those are things that you can learn in literally 20 minutes, you know, and, and sound like an expert. You know, I think that th there is, um, I think there's something to be said too, though. There's an art to how you, how you portray that stuff. Like I don't just, go into an account and say, we have mineral and we're going to do an online handbook for you. And it updates in real time and all of that. Right. You don't just go in and cause I, I say the same thing about features and benefits. Nobody wants to get into features and benefits, right? They, they want to know that if there's a claim, that claim is covered period. Right. End of story. Yep. And so, um, you know, I think that from the standpoint of how you talk about your, your, your services, one thing I feel I do a really good job of, and the only reason I feel that way is because Kyle tells me, and, and I've had heard it from others that I do a really good job of, I just go in and talk about things as if they're already there, right? Like, you know, I talk about like they already have it. I want that prospect to draw the conclusion that, holy crap, man, this guy's talking about stuff we're not getting, you know, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not doing that right now. I don't. If I were to go in and say, hey, you know, do you have an employee handbook? When's the last time you updated it? How much did you pay the attorney to do it? And all of that, you, you're going to get some answers from some people who are in some pain. But if you have a conversation and you frame that conversation around getting the answers to those questions, you're going to get them almost 100% of the time. And your prospect is smart enough to figure out through that line of questioning that you're going to get money. I mean, that, 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 that you're offering that and they're not getting it. One of the things, 100% that, agree. one of the things like it with, with me kind of taking over a lot of the administrative duties of the agency, like all this stuff that we're talking about, man, it makes my eyes glaze over. Like I'm getting all these emails about, you know, 401k audits and, and compliance this and, and, you know, how do you want all your W2s distributed? And it's like, you know, I've been running the administrative part of our agency for 12 days. Like, I, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I should know. And, and I think the same thing happens when we talk to our prospects, you know, to your point, and we use those, that kind of language. I mean, one of the things that we say, and I love, I love a good one-liner because I think people can remember those is I just tell people, look, we're here to get you out of the game of swapping dollars with insurance companies, right? What, what, whatever that looks like and, and put you in control and in, in, in the driver's seat of, of this, because these people, they're used to being in control of their business. They're used to being, they're having employees and telling them, you know, kind of what they want and they're, and they're driving the deal and then they get in this and then we're, we're spouting off all this stuff that they hear one time a year and they get confused. And then they just say, you know what, I'm just going to go with the cheapest deal and hope for the best. And so we come in there and we're kind of a little bit self-deprecating about the business and like, Hey, I apologize. We have trained you to, to, to treat us this way, to buy insurance this way. I mean, I can't tell you how many meetings I've showed up to and, and they will come in and they'll have all their stuff. They'll say, here's my policies. Here's my loss runs. Here's all my rating information. Here you go. Bring me a quote. Let me know if you need something else. And then they about fall out of their chair when I say, Hey, I, I, I never even said that I wanted that. I mean, how do you know I want that? Like, how do you mm -hmm. know I need that? Like, how do you know that? You don't even know that's how we work. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Don't you quote insurance for a living? You know, and I think that gives us just great opportunity to come in and say, actually, what I do is I get people out of the game of swapping dollars with insurance companies. And as long as we keep going down this road that everybody else is going down, you're going to keep swapping dollars with insurance companies. And we want to get you out of that game. And, you know, and I think people respond you know, really well to it. And I and I and like I am kind of a traditional guy, like behind the scenes. I mean, I'm a I'm a coverage guy you know, but definitely not in front of prospects, right? It's kind of like, we're going to get the insurance right on the back, on the back end. You know, you don't, you don't really have to worry about that, but we're going to guide you, you know, kind of through this process that's broken. 
and you know we're, we're gonna we're gonna fix it and I don't know I think I've had a tremendous response to that and you know which is probably the reason we're all on this call together because because everybody that does this at a high level has some form of of that you know that that they're using I like that swapping dollars I'm definitely stealing that Josh you're you're more than welcome to <laughs> You know well, what? Most you know, most everything I got, I stole anyway. So it's all good. Bernie's <laughs> like a walking mashup of insurance knowledge from a bunch <laughs> of other people. And the more people that I talk to that we're mutually connected to, the more sources of that information I'm identifying. We interviewed we interviewed Robert Sutter from Keystone in an awesome podcast. Josh and Robert were both on there. And when I got done, I thought to myself, well, now I know where our girly got more than 50% of the stuff I hear him talking about because, <laughs> you know, he, he learned from, from Robert, but yeah, I mean, to your point, Josh, I think that, and I, I'm pretty vocal about this. I, I think people view us as all the same, right? We're all insurance agents. We're all trying to sell them something. We know that because we get the snide remarks when people find out who we are. Oh, you're another one of those guys, right? <laughs> So when you, when you go in, they automatically assume that you know the coverage, right? So going in and beating on coverage and trying to make them think that the other person has screwed up, that's just a really, really tough case to win. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Focus on dollars, period. If you focus on the money, that's what's going to get people's attention literally 100% of the time. And, you know, it doesn't matter if the policy looks like Swiss cheese because we all know this, we all know there are buyers out there. They're going to go to Hiscox and, or just go to wherever they can go to get the cheapest policy. And they're going to, they're going to get it and they're not going to care. They don't, they just don't care. They, they can't in their mind, they can't afford more. So don't base your, don't, don't base your entire sales conversation on all the features and benefits of what the policy does. They don't care, especially if they've had a claim and not had a claim in 10, 15 years, right? Or, or God forbid, it's a newer company and they've never had a claim and they just under budgeted for their insurance. I dealt with this yesterday with the lady who went, they left us. We have a, a weird niche in, um, mobile dog groomers, mo mobile pet groomers. It's like the complete opposite <laughs> of everything else we do. But these accounts are pretty sweet, man. They're like 2,500 in revenue each. If they have one truck and you know, you're writing the GL, the inland Marine, the professional, the care custody and control, everything that goes with it. And you know, that person's insured properly. Well, this lady sends me a message and she says, I need to cancel my auto policy. And I said, I understand. I said, I, I'll need a copy of the deck page so that I can fill out the loss policy release correctly. But, you know, and, and these, this is transactional business. So it's not like I'm getting yeah. my feelings hurt at this point. This isn't one of my longtime clients leaving me. So she sends this thing over and the liability limits are a third. There is no uninsured motorist. She has a truck and a trailer. So the truck is used for personal outside of when she's doing her other stuff because they unhitch the trailer and park it. There's no UM for her family and friends riding in the car. The carrier is somebody I haven't heard of before. So I go to AM Best and I look it up. They're non-rated. And so I go and I put all of these in bullet points and said, I'll cancel your policy, but I want to make sure you, you know all of these things first. And I said, if you don't understand what any of those bullet points mean, please schedule time. And I'm happy to explain them to you in, in, in detail verbally because how I write and how I talk is different. But the one thing I want you to impress upon your head, this is a younger person, like 23, 24 years old. I said, as you go through life, the cheapest insurance policy is almost always the most expensive in the long run. Almost always. And I said, mm -hmm. I'm not a guy that's going to talk about features and benefits with you. When you ask me to insure your business properly, my firm did our job. I can say with absolute certainty, we've done that. You're with a good carrier in Liberty Mutual who's provided you great pricing and all of the coverage that you should have. And I can tell you that if it was my own sister that was running this business, I would sleep well at night knowing that she's covered correctly. And so this was like three or four weeks ago. She comes back to me and says, all right, go ahead and leave the coverage as it is. And we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll stay with you. Last night I get another email and she said, I, I regret to inform you that I need to be canceling my policy, blah, 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 blah. I said, it's no problem. Go ahead and send over the deck page. And she sends it over and it's the same flipping deck page. 
Yeah. I wasted zero time sending the email saying I will have one of the service people forward you a lost policy release first thing in the morning and we'll get this processed immediately. And oh, by the way, it would be a great service to my agency if you went ahead and moved the general liability inland marine and everything else as well. <laughs> We're not in the business of handling pieces and parts of of, of accounts. And that's it. Man. That, that, I, I say that because that's a perfect example of people not caring about features and benefits and focusing on price. The difference in the, the premium was like 15 or $1,600 a year. If she just made another $150 a month, go up five bucks on your price, 10 bucks on your price. You're not going to lose business at that point when people are already paying you for the convenience of coming to their home. If they wanted to save money, they put the damn dog in the car and take it to the place like we do, and we get it done cheaper that way, right? <laughs> but, yeah. you know, that that's the point. Our prospects don't care, man. They don't care about that stuff. They care about the dollars. And when I'm talking about dollars, and, and you guys both weigh in on this, I'm not talking about the premium. I'm talking total cost of risk. I'm talking soft costs. I'm talking about the cost to of uncovered claims, you know, but you know, what would they call it in, in uh CIC retained losses, both active and passive, right? If I'm gonna be technical in my description of it, they bring people in to train, they hire human resources consultants, safety consultants, they have to have a guy come in or a lady come in, train people how to do the forklift. All of this stuff adds up, right? Every single one of those things adds up. But when you're an insurance salesman, you're not asking those questions. You don't care about those dollars because those dollars aren't what pays you. What pays you is getting the policy written and the qu commission that follows. If you listen to what I'm telling you, people, you're going to write more of those policies that pay you, but you got to think outside the policy to get that done. Elliot Bassett's podcast is what? Get past getting past the premium or something like that. Josh, you were just on it. I plan on listening to it on my road trip to Atlanta this weekend, but I mean, the people that are really, really successful in the middle market selling commercial deals understand you can't just focus on what the premium on the account is. And for the cynics that are out there thinking, oh, this guy's just making up a line of BS so he can sell a higher price policy, turn my podcast off. You're the wrong guy to be listening to begin with. You don't even understand the concept that we're talking about, right? That's why we go in and roll over you like a freaking 18 wheeler when we do call <laughs> on your account. But the fact is you've got to think about all of those things because that's how you tie back the value proposition of your agency, the value you're able to deliver, the things we can do with Mineral, with KPA, using Mod Advisor to audit the mods, using Yellowbird to go out there and do the things we do with them from a loss control standpoint. Those are all things that don't cost that client any money at all because we give them to every single one of our clients. But there's a very high likelihood that if they're not with an agency or another firm, another company that offers those things, whether it be a payroll service or a PEO service, that they're paying other people to have those things if they have them at all. And if you find out they're paying for them, you're going to win that account. There's no doubt in my mind because of the value props in the agency and, and you can play the shell game a little bit with the money. Well, yeah, your premium is $4,000 a year more to go with me, but I'm saving you $14,000. Who's not going to do that deal? Mm -hmm. Well, oh, and, uh, and that's, well, I was just going to say, that's, that's assuming you're even quoting competitively. What if you're just straight up, if you want to win more broker of record letters, you know, if you have the luxury of being able to do that, depending on what state you're in and markets, but then shoot. I mean, everything you're saying, David, becomes way more important, right? Because <clears throat> I think so, so many times, man, there's like a, this, uh, uh, it's like a stigma around talking about cost, right? With insurance. But I think if we're all real, like you were saying, that's what buyers care about. Now it's transitioning their mindset from just premium cost to total cost of risk, you know, and talking about in layman's terms with them and, and helping them realize what soft costs are, are involved with replacing people and all that. But, um, you know, that's how you're going to win more broker record letters. And like you said, also, and if you're in a quote situation, again, yeah, you can have them pay more or whatever, have their breakup with their agent. Um, but, but yeah, it's critical. And it's just weird to me because I feel like everyone is afraid to say, 
to talk about cost. <laughs> but yeah, well, really, I mean, that's talk, what buyers I, care I talk about. about. Yeah, I talk about cost. And I think that's the biggest thing, man, is, is the differentiation between cost and price. That's it. Price is yeah. premium. Cost is everything, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. And if I'm the CFO, I want to know about everything that's under my you know, purview at that point. 100% agree. I'll tell you a good story. Um, if I've told this on your podcast, I apologize, but this this just happened like it don't matter. A, I tell the same stories all the time. People still listen. If I, this happened a couple months ago, the new new uh, producer that I've that I've hired, Adam, in my office, uh, he got he got to meet with this company, and and you know we get there, and I think it's very important how you frame these questions. All right, so if you're in the South, for example, there's drug free workplace discounts. You know, in, in several Florida has it, Georgia. You know, some, but in Georgia, it's seven and a half percent. And so one thing that I always think about when I walk in is I'm always looking for this drug free, you know, drug free workplace. And I just, I don't say anything about it. I just file it in the back of my head. And so, you know, this particular company, we, we get down to, the, to a part where we're talking about soft costs and different things like that. And so, you know, we're wanting to look at the claims. And, and so I start looking at the claims and they pull out the policy. I start looking at the policy and, and I, and I, in, in this meeting, and this, these people are paying probably about a hundred thousand dollars for work comp. And so I, I said, um, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't think this is the complete policy. And they're like, well, this is our workers. Con- this is the whole thing. I said, I, I don't think it is. I said, the, um, I, I said, I think they forgot to forward you the, the, uh, the endorsement for the $7,500 credit for the drug free workplace. And they were like, looked at me like, what are you talking? And I just said, well, you know, you might something you might want to check on. And I, I didn't harp on it. I just kind of went went past it. And then we got on this conversation um, about claims. And there were quite a few small claims that that had happened with this particular company. And instead of launching into all these things that we can do, I just simply said, "How long have these people been working for you when they had these claims?" He was like, well, what do you mean? I, I said, I mean, have they been working you for a week, two weeks, a month? And they looked at the names and they said, well, most of these people have been working for us under a month. And I said, well, that's interesting. I said, because it's proof that you hire your claims. And your hiring practices, where you start at the very beginning of this thing, they end up producing these claims at the end. And so I dropped these two little nuggets on them about about this and then i'm telling you it was i left this meeting and within 20 minutes i get a phone call and they said we just hired this guy he fell off a forklift and he broke his foot when when how do we sign up for this right (laughs) and and i said i said no i said you know what i'm just gonna turn around you know i'm just gonna turn around with print print out BORs right there in the office, have them sign and, you know, and, and take them back to the office. But I think anyway, my point is, is just like to everything that we, we've been saying is to David's point, just kind of assuming that it's being done right now and just saying, Oh, I'm sorry. I guess you're missing this endorsement here or whatever. Right. Or I guess you're missing this piece of paper, or I guess when you hired, when you hired these people, you know, you made sure that they were trained properly and you, you, you know, you did your, your, uh, you know, post offer pre hire medical screens and all this kind of stuff. And like, and then the very thing that you say it happens, this is the best story I've ever had because it literally happened 20 minutes after I left the guy's office. And we didn't talk. I had never, I'd be awarded an account. I'd never seen the insurance policies before. I saw the work comp policy. I had never seen any of the other policies, not laid my eyes on my ever. And that's the point is it's not about opening up the policy and finding three gaps and saying, Hey, I tell you what, you got three gaps in your program. I'll tell you the answer. I'll tell you one of them today is this, there's two more, but you're only going to get the two more if you (laughs) sign this BOR. (laughs) And I tell people, I tell prospects that in the room, like we're not going to do this to you. We're we're not going to play these games to you. And look, and if we don't deliver on our value proposition, we're going to make it easy to leave. We're not going to fight you. We're not going to tell you you're taking food out of our mouth and taking our kids, you know, school tuition. We're, we're just going to let you leave because that means that we failed in many, many times, right? 
And so I don't know. I just think like when you put all that together, it just builds this huge compelling case for these folks to do business with you. And uh, Micah, I know like after just doing a brief LinkedIn stalk of you, you know, you're doing the same thing. I know you got some good stories, man, of doing this. What's, well, you, what's Josh, you saw one. Hold on. For everybody on this podcast who ever wonders if I'm just blowing smoke, right? I know Kyle can corroborate my stories and you're still not going to believe it because he's with me every day. But I sent Josh and Doug Ben's screenshots of an email chain this week where I literally walked away from a $200,000 premium account that would have been 25, 25 to 27 in revenue. And I did it because the guy doesn't fit the mold. You know, he got, he was a referral from another agent. We had a phone conversation. I told him in the phone conversation that I don't play games, you know, that he hires me or he doesn't, that I definitely could help him, but I wasn't going to go and run around the marketplace chasing my tail. I wasn't going to compete on coverage. I have enough letters behind my name that it should be apparent that I know what I'm doing. And he was referred to me for a reason. And if he wanted to proceed, I needed the following things. I needed the marketing list from the broker who didn't do the job the well as well as they should have. So I wasn't spinning my wheels. I needed like the franchise agreement for the operation he was opening and all the other stuff you would ask. And so the guy sends it over. Then he sends over the marketing list in the, uh, uh, the next morning with an email that says, and the other broker said, if you, if you will hold off on approaching here and here. And I wrote back to him and I said, I must not have been very clear in my communication. I don't think it makes sense for me to move forward with you. We don't go into the marketplace to muddy the waters. We don't screw around trying to compete and go place coverage. I told you when I talked to you on the phone, I know I know what's going to happen to your company now. I know what's going to happen to it in five years. And I know what's going to happen to it in 10 because I've represented people in your industry for exactly that period of time. But the the, the essence of the email was basically... I'm out. I'm not even going to waste my time. Now, I know there are people listening to this, but I know there are even more who aren't that would have taken that and they would have looked for that one market that wasn't on the, on the spreadsheet and taken it and run with it and tried to cram it in. And I'm just telling you, man, if, if you're out there and your close rate is, is not where you think it should be, more importantly, if your paycheck isn't where um, it, sh it should be, you need to learn to say no more because you're saying yes way too much. Oh yeah. Think about your time. Think about the time suck too. Not only on it's your brutal. team, but yourself. I was talking to a guy who just called me on LinkedIn. He's a producer. I was like chat with him. It's like, man, sometimes I almost feel like I have so much free time because I'm not wasting time quoting for people that aren't my clients. <laughs> you know, I'm only well, that, working that's on what my I get. clients. I get people all yeah. the time. How do you have time to do this? How do you have time to do that? Cause I don't waste my time on stupid stuff. Yeah. You got a team that helps with the service and the marketing and then you're, you're out there doing what we do, right. Advising clients and finding new clients. But um, yeah, no, but I mean, I, you know, saying no is David, you're probably great at it. I'm pretty good at, it. I was forced into saying no when I was with the, the last agency, which, which got me into this whole mindset of selling on value. So I thank them for that, but it's not easy to do, you know, and we all get sucked into the trap of being allured by the premium or whatever that is, but we still um, do. I mean, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, call, let's call it what it is, man. If you had an account that everything was wrong with it, except for the fact that the premium is $1.2 million you're not just going to turn around and hightail it. Neither am I. And neither is Josh. We're going to no. look at it. We may ultimately do that, but we're going to get sucked in at least, at least for a little bit. So I don't want people listening, thinking, oh, you know, these three guys are holier than thou. They never do this, never do that. Because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you've had a couple of LinkedIn posts in the last couple of weeks that have been extremely vulnerable, right? And I think it's important that we talk about those things. We need to talk about the times we lose an account. We need to talk about the times we get shut down when we're on the phones or whatever else, because nobody wins every single time. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, that's, that's how you ultimately get better, right? It's not just tell, people telling you what you want to hear. It's looking at, at your weaknesses and the times you did get it lured and say, okay, why did I fall into the trap? What, you know, what, what were the carrots that buyer was dangling in front of me? What could I do better next time? I mean, I, that's where it's tough, like depending on your situation, but if you're a younger guy and you have a mentor that can really help if you're out there on your own, that's where it could be tough to kind of see those weaknesses, right? Because we're all just kind of uh, blind to our own weaknesses a lot of times. Um, but uh, 
but yeah, it's, it's a hard game out there, man. It's, it's, you know, people are fighting tooth and nail for, for new business. And I know there's a lot of pressure to write new business. Um, but I think in the long run, I know in the long run, you know, this David, you know, this Josh, that if you stick to your, your method, it, it is what's best for the buyer. And it's more, you know, it's just as important. It's, it's what's best for you and your team. So, um, but yeah, no one's saying it's easy. And that's why we got services like you're providing, right, David, and books out there and other people in the industry that are trying to help. So. Yeah, I think Absolutely. every, I think when you have like clients that, like if I look back at a lot of the clients that I've lost, they are people who I tried to force a square peg into a round hole. You know, like if I, I've lost three clients in the past year and one of them, you know, it was the guy passed away and, you know, his sister you know, took over the company and, you know, it was gone before I knew what, what hit me, but, but there was another one that was a pretty, you know, good sized account, but I just dreaded going there every time. Like I just, I did, I didn't want to go because I would get these, I would get these questions and like, just, it was just, I don't know, maybe I just wasn't mentally tough enough, but it was just like one of those times that every time the phone rang, it was just like, Oh my gosh, here we go again. And, and I just, you know, and for me anyway, when they fired me, it was like, I was like, Oh, I'm free. This is awesome. You know, <laughs> but it was like one of those things where, you know, I didn't want the, you know, the, I guess the, the revenue to walk out the door, but at, at the same time, like it was, it, it, it was just a very, you know, fr free and thing. And, but again, that was an account that I, that I pursued that personality it just wasn't going to be a fit you know and, and I hung on to it for you know probably four or five years but but it was just it was time you know when it was time it was time and uh you know but again I look back at that and say my process was flawed in selecting this person to work with because to me one of the best things about the business is that you can pick your clients like if you're complaining about your clients all the time, then that's your own fault. You picked them. You chose them. I mean, you chose to pick up the phone and call them. You chose to email them. You chose to go to a trade show. You chose to, to connect with some center of influence who referred you to these people. Like, that's up to you. That's your fault. And I just know, like, for me, I think as I've become a more mature producer, like I look at it now and I think to myself, man, like, you know, there's almost nobody where the phone rings now. I mean, no, every time the phone rings as a customer, I'm happy to talk to them, you know, but there was a time I think early on where, you know, that just wasn't always the case for me. Yeah, it's one of the, that's one of the things. So I left my, you know, my book after seven years last year, now it's been a year, but that was one of the cool things. For me, it was like, it was weird because it was like, holy cow, I just lost all my clients, right? And um, starting over, that's something I've tried to be super intentional with this past year and still going into this year is just, like you said, Josh, you know, getting to pick who I work with and um, being disciplined in that process as well. And, you know, who I'm targeting, um, who I'm pursuing after that first meeting. Uh, so it's, that's one of the cool things about starting over on top of, you know, a lot, there's a lot of stressful things, but it's, it's, it can be a really good opportunity to, if, if you, if you find yourself in a book that you just don't really love, <laughs> it's a, it's a good opportunity to build back how you want to build it. So. I don't know if anybody on this podcast doesn't want to have a do over in some aspect of the industry, right? Oh, yeah. tougher when you own the agency at this point. But, you know, I mean, I, I'm the same way, man. And, and that's the thing. If there's advice that I would give to younger producers out there, if, if you're just starting out, do business with who you want to do business with. I understand. I, I preface this it's a little, little late to preface, but I, I say that by saying that you're going to get pressure. You're going to get pressure from carriers. You're going to get pressure from your agency principal. Everybody is going to want you to go out and write as much as you can because they, they want you to hit the number. This is your career. This is what you are going to be doing the rest of your life if you do it right. And so 
you need to build that book starting at the very beginning as if that's the case. That's coming from someone who started almost 20 years ago and would write any shady roofer, you know, anything I could get my hands on to get premium in the door, you know, at the very first agency that I went with, you know, that I, that I was at before I got into full middle market, it was literally, if you looked at my book, it was just like a, a shotgun pattern of crap on the wall of all different industries, right? And now, again, when people want to know, why do you have so much free time? I thought you had a, a, a big book of business. Well, that also is the product of me knowing exactly what I want to write, the, who my ideal prospect is, and then having the systems and processes internally designed to meet the needs of those people. I probably refer, no, not even probably, I refer out more accounts every month than we write. It's just the way it is. And not all of it's bad business, right? Now, I'm not going to take a dog and then send it to my buddy down the street. <laughs> but if I had somebody that was a, a, a truck and trailer um, manufacturer or, you know, they were doing component parts for it or, you know, truck body modifications or whatever else, I don't give a crap if it's right next door to my office. I'm going to send it to Gurley because that's his niche. And he's going to be way better than I am. He's got better carrier partners. He's got better loss control resources. Well, maybe not better loss control resources because we both use Yellowbird for that. But, you know, all across the board, his business has been built around that, right? Now, that's not everything that Josh writes, but a good chunk of his business is that niche. And as a result, he can do that much more efficiently than what I ever would because there isn't a learning curve like there would be for me. That's one of the best pieces of advice I can give anybody. I do have a catch-all. I mean, my niches are pretty simple. It's technology, life sciences, manufacturing, Department of Defense contractors. And my catch-all, which really is still kind of a niche, is any company that's got a mod above one. That's it. That's the, that's the safety valve that I have left for myself so that if I wanted to go out and write something else I, I don't have to refer that away. I'm going to, I'll work with them if the mod's messed up, but we also will only work with them if the entire relationship has moved over. Knowing that that's where I'm going to be, how long does it take when a referral comes in from an agent who doesn't really understand, you know, what our appetite is, or when I get an internet lead or whatever else, how hard is it for me just to flip it over? you know, flip it over to somebody else. That's why I have time, people. It's a, it's an email forward. Hey, I'm sorry, I'm not the best person for you to do this, but I do know that person. I'm gonna, I've copied them on this email. I'll let you take it from here. Boom, done, I'm out, five seconds. Or I could go take the time to spend hours learning their business, learning their industry, going and soliciting carriers, hoping I get appointed, trying to find programs that are out there for, I mean, it's just, you guys know the drill. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to everybody else listening, but this is how you get it done. This is why I was able to go to Key West from Thursday through Monday this last week and, and go fishing and have fun with my wife and not have a care in the world because I know what I'm doing. I, I know exactly where my lane is and I just don't leave it. And it's crazy because you'll have people who will say, oh man, can't you make an exception this one time? And my standard response is, yeah, if you want somebody that's a B or a C player at what you do, why wouldn't you want an A? Well, you're the guy that they referred me to. And I said, that means if, if somebody trusted me enough to refer you to me, that means they trusted that I would give you the best advice possible. Is that a fair assessment? And they said, yeah. I said, and my best advice possible is you need to use somebody who's an expert, not me. It just blows my mind, man. How many people will fight you? No, I really want to use you. You didn't even know me two minutes ago, right? <laughs> yeah, well, they, you. I, I was I just going to say, they probably are afraid to find a, it's hard to find a quality person. So then they're like, well, now I got to, you know, talk with another agent and wait longer. And people are just impatient, you know, the buyers I'm talking about. So, yeah. So here's my, here's my last question as we wrap up, because I've, I've been interested about this with you specifically, because it's um, it's something that, that I've encountered. You put all of this content out. I know that a good bit of it is, if not the majority of it, is producers that are consuming it, listening to it, thinking they're going to go out, replicate it, and do all of that. 
but and your content is much different than mine. Mine is more producer facing, right? Mine, you know, I don't really talk about Florida risk that much, quite honestly, because I'm not, I, I'm, I'm referring almost a hundred percent of what comes into one of my own producers at this point. I don't need my book to get any bigger. I don't want my book to get any bigger. I want to invest in the people that are in the agency. I want to grow the agency as a whole because that's how we're going to scale. We're not going to scale on my back. Um, but I've just had this wild thing happen over the course of the last six months where I have CFOs and CEOs of companies reaching out to me saying, hey, we follow your content on LinkedIn. We love how you do business. Are you licensed in our state? Can you represent us? Because we don't get this type of, of conversation and representation from the agent that we have right now. And if you can't do it, is there somebody in your sphere of influence that you would trust that you can refer to us? That's crazy, man. <laughs> and it's That's happened amazing. over a half, it's, it's happened over a half a dozen times. Now wow. I'm sure that they, I'm sure that if they get to that point that they've gone to my company's website, they've probably read a couple of blog posts or something. I have to believe that's the case, but we're not talking about, you know, the mobile pet groomer. We're talking about middle market accounts. One of them was spending a couple million dollars a year in premium and disclosed that in the LinkedIn message. Wow. That's amazing. That's crazy. Did that where I'm curious, where did that like the a million dollar account where that ever go? Is it still kind of, are you in talks or was it just not a good fit? No. So it was in Texas and I, and it was not in an industry that I wanted anything to do with. And I referred it to one of the agents that are in killing commercial that's in Texas and they wrote it. Oh, that's awesome. So that person wow. gets the best of both worlds, right? Because they, they got an agent that's going to do it that way, but big brothers also kind of watching over to make sure that they got it across the finish line. Right. And that all of that stuff, you know, happened that was supposed to, but I mean, are you getting, you obviously have to be getting traction. You, you know, you haven't quit. And if you're not getting the traction that you would expect, my one piece of, of advice and encouragement to you would be don't stop, man. You know, yeah. you got it. You got to keep it coming. There's a certain amount of, um, validation, I guess, that comes when you have a group of people that are your peers that are in the industry that follow you that want to hear what you have to say. But ultimately, you know, you want that validation through having people, your, your actual intended audience reach out to you. So you don't need to give me numbers, man. You can just give me a yes or no. Is LinkedIn working for you or is the flywheel not caught yet? Yeah. So I would say this, I would say it's kind of a mixture of both. Um, now I've been fairly active on there since 2018, 2019. Now I'm talking active. It started out once a week, right? And that was it. Well, yeah, which... I've, been, I've been going since like 04. So it, oh, that's wow, the other yeah. thing I would tell people. If you see me showing up everywhere, I've been an active LinkedIn user for almost 20 years. That's why. Yeah. It has nothing to do with <laughs> how my awesome content. And I do say that tongue in cheek. You're an OG, man. Seriously. Uh, but so I would say the first couple of years, crickets, nothing. I mean, tons of producer feedback. I wasn't trying to sell anything to producers, which is great. I like helping people out. What well, also helps you whole, boost the algorithm and get your post in more feeds too. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, ultimately if you, yeah, you watch my content, 95% of it is geared towards the buyer. So, I mean, this past, this past year was the first year I would say it actually monetized for me in terms of actual real revenue. And I'd say roughly uh, there was a, there was a DNO deal that would have never happened. That's 20,000 in revenue. There's a uh, $15,000 contract or revenue and then another probably 10. So three deals. I mean, dude, that's for doing nothing. I mean, not nothing, but that's for not having to make cold calls, drop-ins, all that other stuff. So um, I think, I think this, I think it's going to keep growing from here. Um, you know, and uh, I'm excited to kind of see where it goes with the book tied in with, you know, now like uh, the book was just released. I've been making, if I'm making calls or people reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm like, Hey, let me send you a gift. Just send them the book, you know, free right now. I'm on their shelf forever. And I think I'm, I'm excited to see the results of how that seed kind of grows here over this next six months to a year as well. Um, but, but yeah, I wish I was getting a, a lead every week, you know, for, for, like I saw one guy, and I think it depends what industry you're in. I saw some guy here, he's here in Texas and he, he's in uh, premium, not premium financing, um, uh, basically some finance space. Um, but 
He's like, dude, I never make a cold call anymore. I get all my leads through LinkedIn. I'm doing like X amount of revenue through LinkedIn. And I don't know, I think every industry is different. I think insurance, if you're going to bank on LinkedIn for getting rich or building a million dollar book, you're probably going to be poor and out of a job, but it's an awesome addition to your arsenal for sure. And I think it's only going to become more and more critical and more buyers are going to be on there going forward. So, um, but that's encouraging for me to hear your story, Dave. That's awesome that I mean, yeah, and shoot. listen, I, I tell you, I've been active, but it, it's kind of like you, man, it ebbs and it flows. Now, obviously, I've been a lot more active over like the last three or four years, but um, that also has a function is a function of the fact I have software that does a lot of that stuff for me. And I'm not the one that's necessarily putting every single post out and all of that stuff. So, you know, that that changed it quite a bit. But listen, guys, we could go forever. We've been going for an hour. It seems like it's been like 10 minutes. So we need to just agree that we'll get back together, the three of us here uh, at some point, you know, in the future and continue this conversation. Cause I think it's good, man. Everything I heard today is stuff. I wish I heard the, you know, when I was new, um, I can't tell you, I would have listened to it and done it, but I, I wish I would have at least had the opportunity to make that decision. And if you're a younger producer out there, I'm telling you, these guys are spitting gold to you. It's not like we're just bringing somebody in here who, you know, is new or taking, you know, phone calls and binding, you know, bops over the phone. These are middle market producers that are eating what they kill. They go out, they hunt every single day. And that's what you have to do. It doesn't matter if you're hunting in the cyber, in cyberspace, if you're hunting, you know, over the phone, or if you're hunting in person, you got to hunt, you know, you, you, you have to. And that's the only way you're going to make money in this industry. I don't, you know, that's uh, the other thing is that's the only way you're ever going to control the makeup of your book of business. It, you know, that's the beauty of it. We can pick and choose who we call on. We can't pick and choose who calls us. And I'm, I'm going to leave you with that. So Micah, congrats on the book, man. Where can they pick up a copy? Cause I know there's a bunch of nosy producers out there. I catch you guys on my website all the time through HubSpot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Amazon. Uh, it's available on Kindle or your print print version, whatever you prefer. So, and if you have any cool. issues, shoot me a, shoot me a DM or something on LinkedIn and I'll send you the link, but it's. Yeah. Slide up into his DMS on LinkedIn. You know, listen, if you're not following Micah on LinkedIn, you need to follow him. He, he puts out good stuff. I listen to everything he puts out, you know, he and I think very, very similarly differently on a few things, but that's okay. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed we we're supposed to pull the girly man, the Josh girly. You take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you sprinkle some of your own stuff in. Now you have a recipe for a good book of business. So guys, I appreciate your time today. Thank you for coming on. And I look forward to getting this thing out into everybody's hands as quickly as possible. We'll catch you next time. See ya. Thank you.